my administration, I'm going to enforce all laws concerning the protection of classified information. No one will be above the law. Okay, now we know the crimes that the DOJ thinks former President Trump committed. When the FBI served a search warrant on Donald Trump's Florida club, the reaction was shock and outrage. What records could Trump have that would justify a raid on the ex-president's home? Well, now we know that reports indicate that the FBI was sent to retrieve documents in part related to nuclear weapons. And although we don't know what was in the dozens of boxes removed from Mar-a-Lago, we do know that Jay Bratt was present for the search. Bratt is the FBI's chief of counterintelligence and export control. That probably means that yes, Trump had information related to nuclear weapons or national defense. This is a really big deal because presidents do not have the right to classify or declassify records relating to nuclear information. We'll get into that in a second. And now we have the benefit of the actual warrant that was served on Trump's estate. So in this video, we're gonna take a deep dive into the crimes that uh, former President Trump may have violated by taking a U-Haul full of documents to his basement in Palm Beach. But here's what we know so far. On Friday morning, Trump sent messages by Truth Social insisting that the, quote, nuclear weapons issue is a hoax. He also suggested that Barack Hussein Obama had lots of nuclear information that he had used for his library. He also once again accused the FBI of planting information. And almost at the same time, he claimed that he had a standing order to declassify all information taken out of the White House, which seems to run contrary to his allegation that the FBI planted the information that he seemingly declassified. Uh, it has been alleged that Mar-a-Lago does have security cameras, so there is a possibility that the search might have been recorded. Now, meanwhile, Eric Trump did what Trumps do best. He asked people to donate money if they're mad. And now after a week of speculation, we have the actual search warrant that was served, which is fairly unusual because these things tend to stay sealed. So why was it the case that the court unsealed it? Well, according to the New York Times, the government first tried to convince Trump to simply return the records at issue. When he did not comply, the government served Trump with a subpoena to return the boxes. Trump apparently only partially responded to the subpoena, so the DOJ decided to get a search warrant to get the rest of the records. The Washington Post has reported that the FBI sought, among other items, classified documents related to nuclear weapons. Weapons. Attorney General Merrick Garland held a press conference on Thursday where he confirmed three things. First, that he approved the warrant in accordance with the memo on political targets. For more information about that memo, which originated with Trump's Attorney General Bill Barr, check out my other video on the Trump search warrant. Now, second, the DOJ filed a motion with the district court to unseal the warrant application and the warrant itself. That made the two documents public, although it did not unseal the probable cause affidavit that gave rise to the warrant itself. Uh, and third, the, the search warrant and the turn were left with Trump's lawyers in accordance with the federal rules of civil procedure. So now we can examine the unsealed warrant itself. According to the search warrant, the property to be seized included, quote, all physical documents and records constituting evidence, contraband, fruits of crime, or other items illegally possessed in violation of 18 USC sections 793, 2071, or 1519. So this means that Trump is being investigated under the following statutes. 18 USC 2071, which prohibits the concealment, removal, or mutilation of information. 18 USC 793, which prohibits gathering, transmitting, or losing defense information, and 18 USC 1519, which outlaws the destruction, alteration, or falsification of records in federal investigations. Uh, Trump's lawyers have argued that Trump had a right to declassify all these records and that he did so before he left office. However, none of the three statutes require that the information be classified in order for it to be a crime, and we'll talk about that wrinkle in a second. Trump's lawyer, Christina Bob, signed the receipt listing the property that was removed from Mar-a-Lago. The FBI took took about 20 boxes of records, photographs, binders, and handwritten notes. The list starts with uh, clemency records related to Roger Stone and, quote, Info Ray, the president of France. They removed 11 sets of classified documents. Uh, some of these were marked top secret and were only allowed to be stored in special government facilities. It also says agents collected four sets of top secret documents, three sets of secret documents, and three sets of confidential documents, allowing the FBI to win their game of federal gin rummy. Now, the list of documents includes records marked uh, various classified TSSCI documents, and this abbreviation refers to top secret and sensitive compartmented information. Now, sensitive compartmented information is information about certain intelligence sources and methods, and can include information pertaining to sensitive collection systems, analytical processing, and targeting, or things that are derived from it. Now, a person can only have access to SCI if they have a top secret security clearance, and if they have a need-to-know designation. Although the president has access to SCI, that doesn't necessarily mean he has the authority to remove SCI documents and store them in his house after he's no longer president. 
And since the boxes of records recovered from Mar-a-Lago do seem to relate to national defense, uh, I turned to one of the preeminent national security lawyers in the country, and coincidentally, the lawyer who is currently litigating my federal cases regarding John Bolton's memoir and the Inspector General misconduct uh, in the last administration, uh, Kel McClanahan. Uh, so Kel, uh, what could it mean if Trump has or withheld national security information? Well, once national security information is involved, that's a completely different ballgame. And it doesn't even have to be classified information. The Espionage Act, which I'm sure most of your viewers are familiar with, doesn't require something to be classified before it heavily penalizes people who take it, who hide it, who destroy it, who keep it in their basement. It just requires that something be called national defense information, which is helpfully defined as information related to the national defense. That extraordinarily broad definition allows people to be prosecuted under the Espionage Act for taking information that is not classified as long as it has something to do with the national defense. And when you have classified information, well, that triggers a different law called 18 U.S.C. 1924, which used to be a misdemeanor that people pled down to for mishandling classified information. But President Trump himself signed a law in 2018 that made it a felony so that all they have to prove is that there was classified information, he did not store it properly, therefore he's guilty. It's as close to a strict liability crime as you generally get in the intelligence community. And so, Kel, there are also reports that the documents could relate to nuclear weapons. If that's true, how does that change things? Well, the involvement of nuclear weapons information throws a whole new variable into the mix. You see, what we think of as classified information is actually a creation of an executive order. That is, the control of the classification is the exclusive domain of the president and the executive branch. The president can classify, the president can declassify. However, nuclear weapons information is one of the few types of information that's controlled by statute, in this case, the Atomic Energy Act. And the statute says that this information cannot be released or disseminated without going through a certain set of steps. And that is not within the exclusive control of the president. Therefore, even if Trump had said that he declassified this information before he took it home with him, that wouldn't be enough. He would have declassified it for the purposes of the executive order, but he would still be bound by the Atomic Energy Act, which carries its own criminal penalties. Thanks a lot, Kel. Uh, Kel runs the National Security Counselor and does great work, including legal attempts to recover the Secret Service and DHS leadership text messages that were illegally deleted last year that you've no doubt read about in the news. And a, a tax deductible donation to the NSC would go a long way since they're handling many cases, including my own pro bono. So there's a link to that down in the description. So that's the information and documents that are at issue in this investigation. But let's look at the actual crimes that are being investigated. The first is 18 USC 1519, the destruction, alteration, or falsification of records in federal investigations. It states, quote, whoever knowingly alters, destroys, mutilates, conceals, covers up, falsifies, or makes a false entry in any record, document, or tangible object with the intent to impede, obstruct, or influence the investigation or proper administration of any matter within the jurisdiction of any department or agency of the United States shall be fined under this title, imprisoned not more than 20 years, or both. So in other words, to convict a defendant of obstruction under section 1519, the government has to prove each of the following elements. First, that the defendant knowingly altered, destroyed, concealed, or falsified a record, document, or tangible object. And second, the defendant acted with the intent to impede, obstruct, or influence an actual or contemplated investigation of a matter within the jurisdiction of an agency of the United States. Now, the government doesn't have to prove the defendant's sole or even primary intention was to obstruct justice, as long as the government proves beyond a reasonable doubt that one of the defendant's intentions was to obstruct justice. But that takes us to 8 USC 2071, uh, which prohibits the willful concealment, destruction, or removal of federal documents. To establish a violation of this provision, the government must prove one, uh, an individual concealed, removed, or destroyed a record uh, or attempted to do so or took and carried away a record with the intent to do so. Uh, the record was filed or deposited uh, in a public office of the United States and the individual acted willfully and unlawfully. 
Now, note that this is a specific intent crime that requires a person to have had an intention to destroy or remove the records in violation of these laws. And as often the case with these specific intent crimes, Trump might be able to argue that he didn't know he wasn't allowed to remove the documents or destroy them, although there's certainly evidence that he was repeatedly told he was violating the law with the way that he handled records. The Washington Post reported that two of Trump's former chiefs of staff, Reince Priebus and John Kelly, and former White House counsel Don McGahn warned him about the presidential records act. When it comes to a potential violation of 18 USC 2071, there is an additional wrinkle because that section ostensibly prohibits someone from running from office. Now I take a deep dive into that language, the case law and the potential repercussions for former president Trump in a video that's exclusive to Nebula that I'll talk about in a little while. But that takes us to 18 USC 793, which concerns the gathering, transmitting, or losing defense information. Section 793 is known as the Espionage Act, which covers the unlawful retention of defense-related information, which could harm the United States or an ally. Now, the Espionage Act is a bit of a misnomer. It's not really, or most of it is not about espionage. It's really about state secrets. Now, Section 793D makes it a crime for anyone, quote, lawfully having possession of, access to, control over, or being entrusted with any of a range of tangible items or information relating to the national defense, which information the possessor has reason to believe could be used to the injury of the United States or to the advantage of any foreign nation, willfully communicates, delivers, transmits, or causes or attempts the same to any person not entitled to receive it, or willfully retains the same and fails to deliver it on demand to the officer or employee of the United States entitled to receive it. In other words, it's a crime to leak national security information. Section 793F makes it a crime for government officials who have lawful possession of such materials to remove them or disclose them uh, to third parties who are unauthorized to receive them. To be guilty of this offense, the person has to have disclosed the information due to their own gross negligence or because of their failure to report the information lost or stolen. But the Espionage Act is not limited to just those people who wrongfully disclose national defense information. Section 793E also says it applies to anyone who knowingly disseminates, distributes, or even retains national defense information without immediately returning the material to the government officer authorized to possess it. In other words, the text of the act draws no distinction between the leaker, the recipient of the link, or the 100th person to redistribute, retransmit, or even retain the national defense information that, by that point, is already in the public domain. So basically the entire staff of Mar-a-Lago should probably lawyer up at this point. And if the person who is charged under the act knows or has reason to believe that the information in their possession relates to the national defense and could be used to injure the United States or benefit a foreign power, that person's violating the act's plain language regardless of their specific intent. So that means that almost anyone in the chain could be prosecuted under this section. The leaker, who in this case would be the ex-president, uh, his son, son-in-law, a journalist, or even one of Trump's lawyers. Now, there is one crime that isn't mentioned in the search warrant, and that is a violation of the Presidential Records Act. And there's a very good reason for why the PRA is not mentioned in the search warrant. So let's talk about a president and former president's responsibility under the PRA. Section 2203 of the act gives the president the responsibility of identifying preserving records during the administration and requires the president to take all such steps as may be necessary to preserve presidential records. However, a president may also destroy records that the president decides, quote, no longer have have administrative, historical, informational, or evidentiary value. Uh, before destroying records, the president must ask the archivist for their opinion. Although the archivist uh, can give an opinion, the person can't stop the president from making their own call. And if the archivist uh, does not sign off on the president's determination, congressional subcommittees are notified, but it's unclear what Congress can actually do uh, during such a dispute. The statute is murky and vague, which brings up the most important point about the PRA. It lacks a real enforcement mechanism. Although a president is not supposed to rip up records, shred them, or flush them down the toilet, the PRA is at most a statement of best practices like an honor system. This was illustrated early in Trump's tenure when a crew challenged Trump's record keeping practices by suing him under the PRA. Crew alleged that Trump deleted tweets in violation of the PRA and that the White House use of encrypted and auto deleting messages uh, hindered the the ability of federal agencies to perform their duties. Uh, the lawsuit sought a court order compelling the president to stop auto-deleting messages and preserve them under the PRA. But the DC Circuit dismissed Cruz's lawsuit interpreting the president's record-keeping duties narrowly. The court held that mandamus relief was only available under extraordinary circumstances and that a president's record-keeping duties under the PRA are too discretionary to be enforced by court order. Although courts can review the classification of existing records, a court can't stop the president from acting. In other words, the court held it could not tell the president to create and preserve particular records. 
However, courts have been willing to enforce some modest limits on what White House officials can do with records that have already been created. Crew successfully sued Dick Cheney for failure to classify some documents as presidential records. A district court also invalidated an agreement between President H.W. Bush and the National Archives that would have conferred complete control of presidential records on the president after he left office. Although citizens don't have a right to enforce the PRA, the Department of Justice arguably does have a mandate to enforce the PRA in some circumstances. Crew and the National Security Archive wrote to FBI Director Chris Wray and AG Merrick Garland uh, and requested that they investigate whether former President Trump violated criminal laws by willfully destroying and mutilating his presidential records while in office. The National Archives also requested that the Department of Justice undertake an investigation. But there are a number of criminal statutes that make removal and destruction of federal property a crime. It is generally illegal to remove property from the White House. For example, in 2001, Bill Clinton staffers removed the W key from West Wing keyboards right before George W. Bush was inaugurated. This prank was actually theft, and the General Accounting Office interviewed over 100 government employees about the theft of the W's. So if the government decides to charge Trump with crimes related to these documents, what are Trump's defenses here? Well, the first would probably be declassification. Trump's lawyers say that he had declassified the documents at issue. Now, presidents do have broad plenary power to classify and declassify documents. That power stems from their position as commander in chief. The president can delegate this authority, they can exercise it themselves, or they can order the release of classified documents after a certain period of time. And as far as we know, Barack Obama was the last president to issue an order on classified information. Under Obama's executive Order 13526, original classification authorities like the heads of various departments and agencies were allowed to classify and declassify information owned by their organizations. That means that departments might authorize the disclosure of information to someone with the proper security clearance. And this executive order has not been rescinded and federal agencies are still following it. However, future and following presidents like Trump and Biden are under no obligation to follow Obama's executive order. They can tweak the order, issue their own, or simply handle things in an ad hoc manner. And Trump's approach to classified information could probably be described as freewheeling. And after Trump lost the 2020 election, Donald Trump Jr. tweeted that his dad should, quote, declassify everything. We can't let the bad actors get away with it. Uh, could Trump have declassified everything? I think deep in your heart, you already know the answer to that. Well, technically, yes, the president does have the power to declassify every document that the U.S. government holds, but then that information would be public and you could FOIA that information and release it. And Trump's defenders in Congress held a press conference to explain that not everything that is classified is totally classified. And in some ways, what they're saying actually does make sense. The government tends to overclassify records and arguably a lot more information should be available to the public. Uh, transparency in government is generally a good thing. But in this case, we may be talking about some extremely sensitive top secret information, uh, information that may relate to nuclear weapons. And this gets us to one of the main exceptions about the president's declassification powers, which is that the president doesn't fully control information about nuclear weapons. The Atomic Energy Act regulates information about nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. Under the act, restricted data and formally restricted data are top secret information. And the act defines restricted data as all data can concerning the design, manufacture, or utilization of atomic weapons, the production of special nuclear material, and the use of special nuclear material in the production of energy. Now, nuclear information is placed in the formerly restricted data category after the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense jointly determine that it relates primarily to the military utilization of atomic weapons. Now, the president also lacks control over information related to US and foreign intelligence operations. The Intelligence Identities Protection Act protects the identity of covert US intelligence operatives. Their Identities and other intelligence sources are protected by statute and the president cannot reveal them without breaking federal law. And there's also another exception to the president's declassification power, which should be completely obvious. Former presidents don't have the legal authority to declassify records after they leave office. But at base, as noted earlier, declassifying the documents is only one of the hurdles since uh, a lot of the statutes at issue here do not turn on whether the information is classified. Uh, that's completely unrelated. We also don't know if Trump followed the procedure for declassifying the documents. He can't just think declassification in his head while president and the documents are declassified. Uh, the lawyers at Just Security summarize the process for declassification like this. Uh, classified documents have classification markings in the header and footer of each page, 
indicating the level classification for the document as a whole. Furthermore, classified records have cover sheets that specifically indicate when the record was classified by whom and under what authority, as well as when the classification expires. If Trump did in fact order the declassification, he still needed to make sure his staff took the necessary next steps to modify the classification markings on the documents before he could actually handle and store the records as a private citizen, uh, as if they were unclassified. Under security classification rules, a classification marking on a document has to be treated as valid and binding unless and until a subsequent marking replaces it. Appropriate government staffers would have needed to cross out the classification markings in the headers and footers and stamped declassified on the record noting when it was declassified by whom and under what authority. Since that does not appear to have been done with the classified documents reportedly identified to date, the documents remain classified and had to be treated as classified for handling and storage purposes. And it's probably worth noting that ignorance is not gonna be a defense here because reportedly the FBI and DOJ met with Trump several times, issued a subpoena, and not all of the documents were given back. And even the fact that some of the documents were given back initially shows that they know how to handle classified documents and agreed that some of these documents needed to be returned to the government. That being said, Trump might have a First Amendment defense. The Supreme Court does recognize that in some cases, the public's interest in receiving information can outweigh the government's interest in keeping it secret. However, when evaluating First Amendment concerns, the court gives more leeway to reporters who lawfully obtain government documents than they do to government officials. And, uh, you know, when you're talking about classified and defense information or information related to nuclear documents, uh, security interests are probably going to outweigh those First Amendment concerns. So will this be the thing that brings down the former president? It's hard to say, but a lot of people have noticed that a violation of section 2071 can carry with it a penalty of being barred from office. Could that be used to prevent Trump from running again? Well, I have an entire separate video over on Nebula, exclusive to Nebula, which is today's sponsor along with CuriosityStream. Because on Nebula, my videos always come out early with zero ads, and I release exclusive content like this all the time, like this entire video on whether Trump can be barred from office, a video on uh, Alex Jones's test Testimony, whether it amounts to perjury or not, and my first full-length documentary, Bad Law Words Good, which is honestly hilarious. I'm really proud of it. All of this exclusive content is available only on Nebula, which you can get for free with CuriosityStream. Nebula is creator-owned and creator-operated, and there's exclusive new content released multiple times every day by the internet's best educational creators. And by the way, we've been developing Nebula like crazy. Nebula now has apps for iOS, Android, Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, and Android TV. And it was recently nominated for its first Streamy Award. My fellow creators and I really care about Nebula and we're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream because they're the go-to source for the best documentaries and long form educational content on the internet. They even have an entire section devoted to unsolved mysteries and crime. So if you like my videos, you'll love the thousands of titles on CuriosityStream. And the best way to get access to Nebula and all of the incredible content is through the amazing CuriosityStream Nebula bundle deal with its current sales price of less than $15 per year to get full access to both sites. And to be clear, that Nebula subscription is not a trial, it's free for as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. There just isn't a better deal in streaming where you get two great streaming sites with content that you'll actually watch and enjoy for less than $15 a year at the current sales price. So to get CuriosityStream and Nebula for less than $15 per year, just click on the link that's on screen right now or down in the description. It's a great way to support educational content and get tons of exclusive content that you'll love. So for less than $15 per year, click on the link that's on screen right now or down in the description. And after that, click on this playlist for more Legal Eagle videos. So click on this playlist or I'll see you in court.